Of the May 8th, 2019 meeting, Committee okay. of the Whole. Thank you. Uh, all in favor of that? Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I guess good evening to everybody. Uh, so can I get a confirmation of the April 10th uh, minute, minutes, please? I move the council adopt the April 10th, 2019 Committee of the Whole meeting minutes as presented. Uh, thank you. Uh, all in favor? All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so I guess we'll go into Committee of the Whole right now. Uh, can I get a motion to go into Committee of the Whole? Thank you, Councillor Corbiel. I move we go into Committee of the Whole. All right, all in favor? Thank you. All right, uh, let's go to item 6.1, uh, Seniors Property Tax Rebate Program. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and Council. In your packages, you will find uh, details about uh, the policy and procedure for the uh, Seniors Property Tax Rebate. And I can either go through it, or if you've had a chance to review it, I would be able to take questions at this time, whichever you prefer. Uh, does anybody have any, uh, need any clarification or have any questions? Okay. Oh, uh, Councillor Bauer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have a question, Linda, of, of uh, how many, because this is such a great program, I'm sure that it's being implemented in other municipalities. So how many other municipalities were you able to look at before you drafted this? Um, I, I contacted eight or nine, and I got a response from seven of them. Mm -hmm. And were the amounts around the same um, for each municipality that two hundred dollar range for seventy five and above and then the the one fifty and then the one is that how you based your amounts um yes and no almost every uh, municipality does it a little bit different but the basis of it is all the same they base it on alberta senior benefits and they base it on either um, um the tax increase or a flat rate and um one that was an anomaly was they provided $500, um, but they get the funding from someplace else as it's, I can't really explain it because they couldn't explain it to me. Um, but all the others was, uh, w was a base that we built it from. And so do you anticipate council having to um, increase the amount of funding that we give to FCSS in order to um, be able to make this contribution for people or do you think that it'll come from additional sources? What I'm ultimately wondering is, is once we announce this program in Strathmore, are we going to be able to meet the demand? So uh, two things. It was my understanding that uh, Council approved a budget for uh, this program um, and it's outside of FCSS um, funding because we can't use direct FCSS funding for that. And um, based on the statistics that we can figure out from the census, that it would be within um, limits because not all low-income seniors own homes. A lot of them rent too, right? So there's that balance of, um, of that. And we would like to announce it as a pilot project. So as a pilot project, if there's some hiccups along the ways and we have to make some changes, um, to the policy or their procedures or change it for next year or something like that, um, then at least citizens are aware that it is a, a pilot project and there may be some changes to it. Thank you. And I just heard my uh, fellow councillors say that their $40,000 was put into the budget. Isn't that what we approved? For, uh, that was going to be my question. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Me too. I want to say 42000 yeah. Thank you. I'm just looking it up, I think it's okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bauer, and uh, that's good for you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Peterson, would you like to go? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think when, when Mel talk, spoke to, to this issue, when, when I had first asked, he said, based on um, population and tax assessment, 
um, th they would estimate that it would not go over forty-two thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and I, I believe that we might have budgeted less than that because we did believe that that it would come in at under that. But as he said, it, it was a trial run, and we would need to look at it. But when when I was um, when I was looking at it, and when we were talking about tax about the tax year, the current uh, at that time, and setting setting the the tax rate, um, I, I can remember looking at different ones, probably not the same ones you looked at, because I know the whole province of Nova Scotia has it, and I looked at Hinton and, and Okotoks and Calgary and things like that. But they were all based on, on those two major premises, the the fact that, that um, tax increases had hurt uh, uh, low-income seniors with uh, fixed income specifically, and that it, had, it was uh, always connected to a tax increase. That was a, those two were common factors. But I appreciate the work done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think our seniors will very much appreciate mm -hmm. uh, seeing Thank you, Carolyn Sloop. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Uh, Linda, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, and I think it's worth uh, noting for the people at home that, uh, or I guess it's worth saying that uh, as a community, we would like to uh, help uh, people that are in need of help. And and to that end, if uh, something else I like about this is that if anybody uh, is interested in looking into it, if they think they might qualify, uh, I would encourage them to come in down to FCSS because uh, we will uh, kind of look at other programs that you might be available or able to kind of uh, utilize and uh, and that will help bring more money into the community. So thank you very much, Linda. Thanks. I, I just have one, one last thing, yeah. Your Worship, and that is for, for anybody that's listening or watching or may hear about this initiative, it will come back to the May 15th meeting okay. for, for, uh, for vote. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I guess that's you again still. All right, so now we're going to be discussing community and social development quarterly report. So the other presentation I'm doing tonight is uh, a free worship and council is providing an update on the community and social development department. And so as, you aware, as you're aware, community and social development includes family and community support services, the handy bus, indige indigenous engagement, and child, the child youth and family hub. So FCSS has grown a lot over, um, over the last year. And one of the things is our service delivery has increased with while it was growing. And one of the big programs that uh, we're able to offer is information and referral. So people are either calling or coming in, doing an intake process with them to see exactly what their, what their needs are and um, how we can help them. So everybody's story is a little bit different. And so the amount of time spent with each person is a little bit different and the services that we provide to them are a little bit different. And um, one of the things we're really focusing on is um, responding, to, uh, responding to people in the community through a theory of change and trauma-informed care approach. So we really have something based on the services that we're providing and while we're, why we're providing them and that we're practicing best practices as we go along. And so one of the... Um, the new programs that we're doing is we partnered with the Ministerial Association to provide additional supports to residents that are having a difficult time um, with basic needs. Now, as you can see there, um, with the points of contact that, that we've had with people um, over the last year and into the first quarter, and these statistics, sorry, are for the first quarter um, of 49% of people requesting support services with financial security. 27% for food security, 15 for housing security, and 14% um, for mental health. And there's other things that go along with that, but those were the, the largest ones that came out of the statistics that we're keeping.
And so one of the other services that F FCSS in specifically provides is in-kind services, and that's been growing over the last year too. <clears throat> we have staff that sit on a variety of different uh, committees in the, in the community, and we have community groups that require assistance with some administrative support, such as photocopying, um, mailing things out, um, being, um, being the main place where people can come in to get their information, and so on and so forth. And so one of the things that we're trying to track now is how, how much time and how much um, financial contribution are we doing in in-kind. And so as you can see that with over 400 hours of staff time um, is close to $10,000 a year just in staff salary and not with all the other stuff. And that's part of the FCSS mandate to give back to the community in that way. We just want to show that those are some of the things that, that we're doing. So for example, with the Christmas hamper, um, Darlene, the programmer, is the treasurer, and so she spends a lot of her time with that particular program throughout, throughout the year because it's just not for a couple of months during the Christmas season. It's long term over that. Um, and then one of the other things we've done is we have um, invited service providers in the community and the surrounding area for mental health first aid uh, training with seniors. And so to date, we have uh, 17 town staff and 33 individual service providers who have been trained. And we're going to be training another 25 in the next couple of weeks. And so that's really exciting to see the community coming together with town staff and other service providers to do some professional development together. <clears throat> and so uh, the Handy Bus um, is a unique program because the Handy Bus has its own board of directors and, this, and the staff and the operational is, is uh, town responsibility. And so we've seen some changes with our drivers over the last few months, but now we have, um, uh, we have drivers for every vehicle, and so we're glad that that is balancing out now to have that more consistency and regularity of, of having the drivers. And another thing we focused on too um, is with the professional development with the handy bus drivers. And so they have all have participated in mental health first aid with seniors, um, fire extinguisher training, Q strength training, working with seniors, how do you talk to seniors differently than you would talk to a non-senior? How do you talk to somebody with a disability that is having a hard uh, time or unfortunately, um, you know, have some different issues that is very embarrassing to them? How do you deal with that? Because they're not personal care attendants, they're drivers, but how do you manage that um, within all the other things that you're doing. <clears throat> and so the other exciting thing with the uh, handy bus is that they purchased a new bus last year and they also purchased a new bus this year, so we're just waiting for uh, the other bus, the other bus to um, arrive. And the board finished, uh, completed a strategic plan over the last couple of months, and so they're very excited and interested in implementing it if I ever come back to a meeting, right, Jason? I was going to yeah. ask you when, is that ready to go, or? Um, so Indigenous engagement. I'm very proud to share the work that we've been doing with, uh, with Indigenous engagement. Sorry, just excuse me. So one of the unique things we did is we partnered with Alberta Métis Nation on the community opiate training, and we're having ongoing conversations to bring them back to our community. And one of the things we heard, <clears throat> excuse me, when we were doing um, when we were doing that, is people were reaching out and asking if there could be more Métis type things in our area because we have a very large population of Métis people, and they don't always want to go to Calgary. And so we're in the midst of having conversations with the Métis Nation, um, talking about different services that, how we can coordinate with them to bring similar services out into our community for that uh, population. Um, in working with Siksika, um, we were surprised, but not so surprised to hear that um, the food bank is, usually has no food in it. 
And so we started uh, educating different community members when they were doing fundraisers and stuff to see if they would be interested in once in a while focusing on Siksika Nation Food Bank. And we had a huge response in our community uh, for that. So we were really excited uh, to hear that. And the manager of the food bank was just ecstatic that we took several vehicles of, of food out there. And so we're trying to rotate that a little bit too to be able to support um, the food bank out there. And then as you know that um, we were successful in our application for the blanket exercise through AUMA, and that's on um, May 22nd. And so just not elected officials, but um, we have some senior leadership and management and frontline staff. And depending on the maximum amount of people, we're going to be inviting select service providers to come and participate in that as, as well. And <clears throat> we've been working on National Indigenous Peoples Day. So on Friday, my tw May 21st at Kingsman Park, between noon and... June, si June 21st. June 20th. That's right, June, yeah. June 21st, yeah. <laughs> um, between noon and 6.30, we're going to have um, two teepees set up with teepee teachings. Uh, we're going to have powwow dancers. We're going to have uh, indigenous vendors. We're going to be um, engaging the community with uh, elders that are going to be doing storytelling. And we're planning on doing a couple of other things. We don't have all the um, everybody confirmed, so we haven't put out the agenda yet. But over in the next week and a half, we will have everything confirmed, and we would be able to uh, we'll be able to send everything out when that comes when that comes out. And then, of course, one of the things we're continuing to do is educating town staff and service providers and the public in general about Indigenous culture, history, smudging, Blackfoot values, protocols, and much more as we uh, as we <coughs> move forward with our Indigenous engagement. So the Child, Youth and Family Hub has been offering some new programs. So one of them is uh, Noon Teen Time, which has been offered between uh, Monday and Thursday from noon to 12.45, where the kids can come in uh, from the junior high and the high school. Um, there's some few snacks there. We have the uh, um, like different games set up for them. There's everything from board games to video games to uh, ping pong to air hockey to just if they want to sit around and listen to music and hang out with their hang out with their friends. And to date, we've had over 34 unique individuals visit um, throughout that time. And then Teen Night has been a great way to connect over 60 unique youth aged between eight, 10 and 18 outside of regular programming that's happening. And so everything from um, learning new ski skill, for example, they went to the archery range one night. Um, there was a group of kids that were interested in art, so they did some stuff with art. They had a sports night. Um, <coughs> they did some cooking, and one night they just listened to music. And so that's something that um, is structured but not structured. And so it's really, um, it's really gaining, um, gaining some insight. And then one of the really cool programs um, we did this uh, last quarter was uh, character building that was facilitated with Wheatland Crisis Society. And it was for uh, kids aged six to 11 years old. And so topics included healthy relationships, building self-esteem, bullying prevention, strengthening empathy, skills and mindfulness. There was a maximum of 20 kids allowed and we were full and we had a waiting list and we had people asking when we're gonna, uh, going to offer it again. Um, and then I just want to end the presentation with two things to remind everybody that it is Mental Health Week and just to remind everybody that the Volunteer Appreciation event is on Saturday. And so I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Councillor Sobel. Actually, thank you. Uh, for, uh, thanks for a great presentation there, uh, Linda. Just in regards to your very last comment, I wonder if you can uh, just uh, tell her our listening audience out there, uh, the uh, a couple more details. That's of course that's open to all our volunteers. And uh, do they is registration pre-registration required? 
For sure. It would be great if people could uh, mm -hmm. register by calling the FCSS office. We understand that doesn't always happen. And so um, we would invite people to come to the um, sports center, uh, the sports center um, between uh, one and four o'clock on, on Saturday. And there'll be uh, free volunteer gifts uh, for the first hundred participants. And so we wanna, we wanna thank our volunteers. We wanted to engage them, and we wanted to thank them by giving them free access uh, to the new to the new center. Thank you, you Councillor Sobel. Uh, Councillor Peterson. I want to echo my thanks, of, of course, for for all of this. But I had a question specific to the um, to the Indigenous Engagement Day. I think I think it's fantastic. But interestingly enough, I had a call today. From a, from an elementary school in town, who, who's also planning and has planned a, an Indigenous Day that day, and they were wondering if you would be open to to them uh, coming with school children during that day. Def definitely. And then they also thought that um, they they would like to connect with with FCSS because they have um, I think visions of bringing uh, a, or setting up a display of all the things that their school has been doing as uh, global citizens and in uh, in community so we would love to I connect can connect with you them. and you yeah bet. I just I just think that that finding those uh, connect that those connections in all of our communities is uh, really really an exciting initiative and I, I really appreciate the work you've done around that thank you thank you uh, anybody else no thank you um, James I'd just like to say uh, really outstanding job, Linda, and thank you so much. I'm very, very grateful for the work that you've done. You've obviously put in a lot of hard work, and I'm just really pleased and wanted to share that. And thank you again. Thank you to you and all your team. Thank you, James. Um, one question I have been tasked to ask uh, about the Handy Bus strategic plan, um, if it will be coming back soon. Uh, yes, whenever our next meeting is at the end of the month. Yeah, so I think the 27th. Yeah. Okay. You bet. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. All right. We'll move on to uh, number 6.3. Craig, please. So this will be an operations update. Mm -hmm. um. I'm most challenged. Okay. Good evening, Worcester Council. Uh, just a little update on the operations department since the last time I was here. Um, before I start, I just wanted to introduce Mike Brazel. He's our maintenance planner and coordinator. Welcome. So, so Michael has basically been some of the backbones of the last uh, little while, making sure that the work gets coordinated and the crews are out and everything else. So. Anyways, I'll just quickly go through this. Uh, some of the accomplishments and stuff like that. One of the things that we had to do in the beginning of February was basically uh, some operational training and orientation. One of the things was the ice safety and rescue. Uh, one of the things we found was we were actually quite deficient within our own Parks and Recreation and Public Works Department to basically handle any sort of ice uh, safety issues, especially considering we're clearing the lake um, constantly with uh, Kubotos and everything else. So, so we were very successful. We put through eight crew members. Uh, you can see the picture of them. Uh, I believe it was minus 25 when that photo was taken. So they were, um, it was kind of cold out there. A warm day in February. So they were having, uh, but they were having fun. So nobody, nobody had to go in the water though. So. The other thing that we have, as far as our staff training is, what we did was we actually started charting, uh, I'm sorry about the small print, but it's, it's a fairly big chart. Uh, basically the list of all our operators, all the pieces of uh, major equipment that we have, 
and the status of their uh, training, uh, whether or not they're orientated, they're cert uh, certified training, or if they required the training. So we're trying to keep on top of this so that we'd like to have everybody on green. Obviously, it takes time to get everybody to be green. Um, but that's our goal, is that basically all our operators and all our staff are totally qualified to, to run our major pieces of equipment. So, so, and just an update on the council special request is going back to July. Um, we ended up, we did buy the, the generator that you guys have graciously, generously allowed us to buy. Um, the sump pump was in March. Good thing we didn't have to use it. We didn't have any flooding issues, but now we're prepared. The traffic control boards, which is to be used for Highway 1 when we start the deployment of the, the uh, planters, this will eliminate the traffic control costs of hiring a contractor. That came in in April. They've been installed. They're on our vehicles, and they're ready to be used. Uh, the trackless also arrived in March of, this is separate, this is your capital purchases. The trackless arrived in March. We've had our first orientation. The trackless is the yellow one, and that big ugly thing that's sitting there is a boom flail mower that will do the ditches. Mm -hmm. Right now we contract that out, and now we'll be able to bring that back in-house. And, uh, oh, sorry, there's a little typo. It says, it should be 20. Uh, the next one is the Aquaside machine, which is the other picture. It should say April of 2019 when it arrived. So basically, the, to, if you can look at the picture, the, there's a ta white tank on the back that holds 200 gallons of water. Mm -hmm. The Aquaside machine sits in the middle. The front part is all the PPE that goes with it mm -hmm. because the guys have to make sure that because they're dealing with steam. And the back is all the hoses. Uh, we're waiting for the weeds to start to grow so we can go after them. Um, so this is all set up on a trailer. And uh, when we get it out there, we'll let you give you guys a little bit of heads up where we're going. So if you wanted to see it in action, mm -hmm. this will eliminate the, the vast majority of use of herbicides <coughs> and pesticides. And since uh, we're trying to go as green as possible, um, it's going to be a nice addition. We've already got inquiries from uh, uh, another city that found out that we bought it. So they want to see it too. So hopefully we'll be the leading edge on this one. Some of the accomplishments to date for parks in the winter months, which is when we do our major tree uh, maintenance, uh, we pruned 118 trees, did nine removals. Um, still more to come. There's a lot of tree inventory that needs to be addressed, but unfortunately it does take a lot of time. The outdoor ice rink was flooded and maintained most of the, the winter. Our biggest problem was when we get to a warm smell, we lose all the water so that we have to reflood it and hope that it stays warm. Uh, also, the, the new Maple Garden accessible playground is, uh, is, has begun in construction. They did the removal of the old playground, and this was partly successful through the grant from the Alberta Recycle Management Authority. Uh, we're kind of hoping that this will be open by mid-June when they get it in there. Uh, the playground is designed to be accessible for uh, both physically challenged as well as mentally challenged children. So, And that's our focus. When we do the replacement, we want to make sure that the, the, the playgrounds are accessible to every type of child, every, every type of children's needs. Um, moving on, uh, some accomplishments from the Public Works Department, which is the majority of the winter months. Uh, we had the arrival of the new single axle dump. That's the picture that you see there. Uh, that was actually quite handy, came in quite handy in the winter months. Uh, since January, uh, we used uh, 331 tons of pickle mix, and uh, which we had to obviously remove because that, the, with the street sweeper, which pretty much is, I think, Everything's all gone from the streets. I don't think we have anything out there. Um, I was informed that Volkers will be doing 817 tomorrow, so that's mm -hmm. kind of good news for us. Um, we also used some ro about 19 tons of road salt. Um, when we had that little storm about a week and a half ago, we actually just used a, a small amount of salt to get rid of the ice buildup. We didn't want to put pickle mix back down. Um, waste management carts, this is our ongoing issue. Um, since January 1st, 
Uh, we replaced 28 green carts. We uh, did repairs on 50 black carts. Uh, we deployed 11 new carts for new houses and stuff like that. So you can see we're spending more time maintaining it than we're uh, getting it out. Other accomplishments, the Kinsman Accessibility Dock was completed in April this year. Uh, I was really pleased the other day as I drove by and there was two lovely senior citizens sitting on the bench looking over the water and, and enjoying the, the geese and the ducks. So, so it came in handy right away. So, uh, Potholes and paving repairs by Calgary Paving has been completed. That's, uh, we do have two um, dig sites in town that were the Calgary paving is just still waiting for the frost. We still get frost in the morning and because they're large paving sections they would prefer to wait another week and once those are done. We've got a list of potholes that Mike has scheduled to start tomorrow. We're kind of hoping again it doesn't rain and we don't get heavy frost because when we get that we're hooped again. Uh, the tennis court fence replacement had, was completed in 2009, uh, April 2019. I don't know if anybody's been up there. Uh, it now is up to a proper code and standard for a tennis court. Um, so we shouldn't have a problem with the next windstorm that uh, basically caused the problem in the first place. And back to street sweeping, goes back, which goes back to, we removed uh, uh, 60 tandem loads of debris from the roads, which is approximately about 1,200 tons of material. So it's not just our material, but we also got to get picked up Volker's material as well, so. Okay. Um, upcoming, uh, on May the 19th to May the 25th is the National Public Works Week. And next week, uh, Melissa will be coming forward to asking for a proclamation. So she, I'm trying to get her to come up to council. So. Uh, Strathmore will be hosting its first annual celebration. And one of the things we're going to be hosting, holding is a uh, equipment in the park, which is going to be in Kinsman Park. Uh, we'll have the Name the Duck uh, Dump Truck Contest. Uh, there'll be kids' activities and uh, public works and parks representatives will be there to... Kids will be able to jump on the grader and take a look at it and have an idea what it's like to be in the public works world. So we'll bring up some of our big guns. So make them. So. We'll also have the Kubota, the, the uh, trackless out there. Um, one of the things was the GPS tracking system. That's, this is just basically since April. Uh, we've identified some issues. There's some technical issues with the system and it has to do with and I have to defer to my IT people, uh, baud rates and how it's communicated. So there's a couple of numbers in there about idle time, and which is almost like 99%. And for whatever reason, it's still sending a signal, even though the machine's shut down. So we're trying to address that. But this basically gives you the idea, the kilometers that traveled, uh, and the percentage of time it sat idle, and the number of days it's operated. This is just a screen capture. The, there's more equipment that's on the list, but I can only squeeze so much into the picture. So this is actually coming in quite handily with us, uh, especially when we had that blizzard the other day. Uh, we were able to watch real time where the vehicles were uh, and then redirect them as we needed based on what we were seeing out there. Um, so. And it also became a very much of a uh, safety issue, knowing exactly where the guy was, and if there's any reason that he stops longer than for a couple minutes, then we were able to call and find out if there's an issue. Okay, moving on. Okay, uh, to address the idle time, though, because there are some uh, pieces of equipment that were showing some idle time that actually was registering proper data. Um, uh, Charles Lockhart and Chris uh, Stickle, who are our operations supervisor, our operations mechanic, have developed a, an acceptable idle time chart. So based on the weather conditions, the, the type of engine it is and everything else, what can be shut down and what cannot be shut down. And so basically with that, we're, tr we're going to try to really push that into the winter months because it's usually in the winter months that they, they let the vehicles run. Um, some of the big diesels, you just don't shut them down. You just, they just have to idle. That's all there is to it. So, But we're trying to address it because obviously as it burns, it burns gas and it burns money. 
Okay. Uh, some of the concerns that we have, uh, as I probably raised before, is aging equipment. What you see there is our PW34, which is a champion small grader. It only had 1,300 hours of operations on it, which is relatively little. Um, the problem is it is a discontinued piece of equipment and replacement parts had to be manufactured. Uh, the grader sat idle down like in this condition for five months waiting for the parts. So one of the things that I will be putting up for um, tender for uh, is uh, basically have somebody come in and do some uh, equipment assessment, fleet assessment, and just give us a longevity, what we got left, what needs to be replaced, and give us a capital forecast for five to ten years. So that would, it will give you an idea of where we're at and what you what we need the budget for. Uh, other concerns, staffing, obviously, uh, in the July uh, 2018 presentation, you got granted operations, three temporary operators. Their term ends December 31st, 2019. So when it comes up to the budget year, um, hopefully between Ryan and I, we'll be able to give you some data to justify trying to keep them. But with our success last year, I, I think it, um, we, we've shown that the number is pretty much what we need. Uh, we also have a sole mechanic, uh, which faces a lot of growth and backlogs due to the aging infrastructure. Um, the town may have to look at outsourcing some of its uh, equipment for third party so if, if it, we continue to get backlogged. Um, City Works is coming online. Uh, we may need to increase looking at clerical support in some way to open, close, and to cost out the work orders, but we'll have a better understanding as we roll it out. We're right now, we're just sticking with what we've got. I'm just worried that data is going to just back up and back up and back up. With these systems, it's like feeding the beast. You just got to keep, keep the data alive. And sort of upcoming initiatives, obviously one of the things we're going to bring out is an outdoor ice inspection and maintenance policy now that we have our staff, st uh, staff trained. Um, we want to make sure that the ice that we're going on to is safe and we want to make sure that uh, we have a proper program in place. Um, there's also a tree protection bylaw that we're going to be bringing forward. Um, and that won't steal my colleagues' thunder when they bring it forward. That'll be coming from the planning department, but we're working cooperatively with them. Thunder. Sorry? No stealing your thunder. No stealing your thunder, okay. The other thing we want to look at, uh, we've already researched and we've already drafted up and adopt a park policy, a program, and this could be a park or it could be a flower bed or it could be something. We want to get the buy-in and the inclusion of the citizens into their areas. So this is one thing we're going to bring forward. Um, we're looking at probably a 2020 rollout for it. We're kind of late in the season to try to bring it in now because really we've already got our plan set. So, But we, we want to also include an educational component for the, for the citizens so they understand how to maintain the, the flower bed, how to maintain the, po uh, the park. Um, had a good conversation with one of our residents today. We were doing some we were doing some cutbacks of some trees, and he was concerned about some trees and everything else. And Don and I had a long, long uh, conversation with him, and we, we explained to him what we were doing was actually beneficial to his trees on his property, because there's black knot, and then you'll be able to get at it and everything else. So um, that's it for my presentation. Is uh, throw it open for questions. Uh, Councillor Sobel, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I apologize, but I do have a couple questions and comments in, uh, as well. So the first comment is regard, regarding the, uh, <laughs> no, I lost it. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, I don't know where my sheet went on this, but anyway, it was the cross training, the, uh, the, your training uh, schedule for your staff. I just think that it's an absolutely amazing idea. I, I've seen that kind of thing in the RCMP in regards to training, mm -hmm. and it really works well. So it's, the problem, of course, with that is always trying to keep it up. But uh, it, it's such an amazing idea to have everybody trained on all the equipment. It, um, I'm sure that'll make life go much easier. Uh, the Aquaside machine, very anxious to uh, to have a look at that. And um, uh, 
uh, I think that's also really just brilliant um, for a number of reasons. Um, if you could uh, help me out with the uh, waste cart program <coughs> replacement and repairs, Do you, what's the, what's the the main issue with these carts? Um, in most cases, it's still the wheels. Still wheels, eh? And and is that is that uh, so? That's first quarter, January to April. Uh, it's just the first quarter. It's the first three months. Yeah. We haven't included April yet. Are you happy with the carts? The black carts and the green carts. Yeah. Actually, they're they're, they're the, exactly the same type of cart that yeah. I use when when I lived in British Columbia. Right. So they seem to never have a problem in BC. No, I can only assume weather conditions. That, the, the way the wheel is designed, there's two plastic little tabs on the inside. So as you get into the colder and really frigid temperature, plastic has a way of really hardening and becoming more brittle. And all it takes is more impact onto the ground or how it's mm -hmm. handled. And once, that, once one of the two tab breaks, the wheel will come off. And of course you don't get that cold weather out in BC. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyway, I guess it's not, it's not uh, too bad. But, uh, the deployments, is that to new residences? That's for new residences. Are you finding that when people are moving that they're taking their carts with them or are they leaving them? Uh, we, haven't really, we haven't really found that they're actually taking them. Most of the time it's, it's moving into new, new, co new complexes. Okay, so. thank you. And, uh, and lastly, uh, you spoke about... Um, uh, and this probably is a question for Donna, uh, but you did speak about uh, trees and black knot, and uh, I, I, I just happened to have reposted some information from Calgary on my uh, counselor Facebook page today, and the response was I, I, like unbelievable responses. A lot of interest in mm -hmm. in, in in the rules and 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 what what this is, and so. <coughs> We obviously, I, 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 th I think, have to rev up our, our information to our citizens in regards to that. Uh, I, I learned something that you don't, uh, you don't start cutting away black knot in the summertime. It's got to be late fall or early, really early spring. So uh, that's, I, I think, is really important. But, but the question that's, one of the questions that did arise is whether and uh, what, what protection does a neighbor have against a, a neighbor whose yard is full of black knot? That I think you'll see with a proposal for a tree protection bylaw. Oh, okay. I was hoping that that was going to be yeah. what you That's were going to say. One of the things that we'll be first, um, trying to get from council is whether or not they want to go into that far-reaching area. Just on the note of the the communications, um, with the help of the communications department, and <laughs> back in the corner. <laughs> Uh, Donna drafted up uh, several uh, communiques that we will be giving to residents. Great. The communiques have strict instructions on how to deal with black knot. There's also some oyster. Yeah. Oyster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, which we're yeah. actually, we have to address at Strath, uh, Strathmore Lakes area. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of different, a uh, couple of diseases. So we're, we're trying to develop an inventory of these notifications. So when we get the when we notice it on private property, we'll be able to hand it out. Perfect. And in most cases, we're trying to counsel them to seek professional. Absolutely yes. You know, because yeah. cutting cutting in the middle of the summer, you just expose sap, and it, the the spores are just going to go right out the tree. Yeah. So. Craig, I thank you and your staff for everything you're doing. It's uh, our that your department has has come a long way in the last couple of years, and yeah. it's really noticeable and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sobel. Uh, Councillor Corbiel. Thank you, Your Worship. I want to start off. Thank you very much, Craig. I like the report. I think you guys are doing a great job. My, I just have one quick, simple question. Um, you talked about like the one mechanic facing a backlog. Is this impacting regular maintenance, and is that falling behind? Um, no, it's not. Uh, the regular routine um, preventive maintenance that goes on to the vehicles gets done all the time. Uh, what we get hit with is when we get a little one-offs that take a lot of time. Uh, one of our vehicles right now uh, may have a serious engine problem, which will take a lot more time to diagnose than, than it would normally um, if you're just doing regular maintenance. Mm -hmm. But uh, Chris is phenomenal. He's probably one of the better hires the town has. He's a local 
local guy. Uh, if you could clone somebody that is for the S on his front for a mechanic, uh, Chris is probably the guy that you want. So, but uh, he he keeps up with it. But as the stuff ages, mm -hmm. it does. You do get hit with the unexpected breakdowns. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Corbeil. Uh, Councillor Peterson. Thank you. I appreciate uh, all that you're doing. And I have. Um, a couple questions. What one one is with regards to the playground equipment that you take out. What what do you do with it? Uh, most of the time, it no longer meets CSA standards. Oh, okay. So you can't deploy it. Yeah. So the contractors usually take it. Um, they they'll break it up for recycle right. recycle or whatever. Is there ever a time when it when it still would meet CSA standards? I just think about all the places that I know about that don't have playgrounds. Not, not here, not in our community, but that have nothing. Um, I'd have to check out the liability of us donating mm -hmm. a playground mm -hmm. unit that doesn't... And people yeah, signing off on the liability. And then, yeah. yeah, because most of the contractors won't reinstall anything that ha is, doesn't no longer meet CSA standards. Oh, of course. That doesn't mean that if you're taking a home and putting it in your own backyard and, or you're taking the onus on right. yourself. Um, we've never looked at... Doing that, I mean, we do have another playground schedule for next year. Uh, if that's the wishes of council, we could easily find a way of pulling it out. And oh, something I yeah. talked to you about, yeah. if, if, if it did. Yeah. The second thing is, is that I, I receive a lot of um, comments, positive comments about information that Donna passes along to people, and it, it, it's continued to just the trajectories like this. Mm -hmm. And and uh, because of, of my association with Communities in Bloom and other groups associated with that, especially uh, older in high regard, and lately there have uh, there's a group of people who would very much like her to do a bi-weekly radio show on our local radio, or at least to be engaged in the Strathmore Now project. So that radio station's getting a lot of play. Uh, if you go into almost every business in the community, it's played. I, I hear it now when I go into people's homes. And so so there is just a, a huge desire. You know, and I said, well, you know what, what we could look at the town webpage. It's like, yeah, we never look at that. But <laughs> so it's like, oh. But I, I, it is a, a huge credit to her. I don't know if that's a possibility. I, I don't, I think it would be a benefit to the radio station as well to have to have somebody that's clearly generating that kind of interest in uh, in the care of our community, I don't know. I'd really uh, if, if you would just consider it. I don't know. I don't know what the possibilities are, yeah. but it's a credit to her. Yeah, um, you know. Again, uh, I speak a lot of praise on on Donna and, and her abilities. Um, again, if it's if it's something that's to the benefit of the, the town. It's definitely something we can look at. Uh, um, basically, the past since uh, we hired the 18 summer students uh, May 1st, she's kind of swamped with training them. But uh, but if it's something that yeah, if if they open up a if the radio show wants to open up a spot, uh, I don't see a, a major issue from our end of it. So but, uh, I, I, text I rem messages about about uh, from people watching saying yes. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was a as a kid, I used to listen to the radio, and they used to have a, a g local gardener on the radio mm -hmm. every Sunday morning, yeah. mm -hmm. and it was a call-in show. And yeah. I'll tell you that that that, that gar it was extremely popular. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and it was very popular. <coughs> and then Wim Wim Van Der Zand went on after it. Well, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, I, I probably learned more on that radio show than. That I ever did, but yeah, if it's something that's interesting and Donna wants to put in the time, I'm sure that we can arrange something. Just a follow up. Just a follow up to that. I think that that it, it really would speak to all the local issues too. That that and and Jason's idea of you know adopting park benches or adopting parks and mm -hmm. and uh, you know Councillor Montgomery has been really thorough. Or Deputy Mayor Montgomery is very thorough in pursuit of that. And I think it would really lend itself to that local flavor if there was some. That would be neat. Thank you. Uh, it'd be it'd be good, good from our point of view too. Uh, thank you, Councillor Peterson, Councillor Cox. Thank you, Your Worship. I just had a quick question for you. 
Um, equipment in the park, May 25th. What time? What's that? What time? What time? Uh, noon to three, I believe, is what they scheduled it for. And you'll be advertising that? I uh, believe that Melissa is doing it through. So, yeah. Thank you. This is really Melissa's driving us to get this done. So. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cox. Councillor Bauer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Craig, I just want to say thank you to you and your staff for um, all your uh, hard work in operations and public works. It really makes a difference in Strathmore. Uh, what you do uh, especially can be seen by all the public. And uh, with the help of Mother Nature, uh, we had a, a good winter, um, but you really still did uh, such an exceptional job. So thank you for that. The Pardon me. <laughs> it was cold, but we didn't get like the snow that we did in previous years. What? <laughs> it was cold. Okay, I live in a bubble, <laughs> a really happy bubble, and I go on holidays a lot, obviously. <laughs> but thank you for your work. No. Not like last year. Well, anyways, I'm not going to end up going there. The tennis court, which I have seen, um, that new fence structure is very, very solid, and I really like it. Uh, people have asked me that play pickleball whether or not there will be any windscreens on that. Where the, was the problem that the windscreens were on there, and is that why the fence went down before? The that was probably the major culprit was the windscreen on that but the the current design of the the tennis court and the proper gauge of the 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 chain link fencing and everything else and the spacing shouldn't could uh, shouldn't have an issue with putting back the screen the only problem is we didn't budget in our uh, capital to put the screen back in we don't we really don't. the screen is ten grand yeah, so we have the screen, but we can't put it back on. No, the other ones, the other ones, the it's the other ones like torn. It's it's in terrible shape. So. Okay, the so. the only difficulty is is because that is a north south facing mm -hmm. and not an east west. They get crosswinds that come through there, and so it should be something that perhaps we look at in the future if there's some um, money I, available. I have to take full responsibility. I wasn't aware of the 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 need with pickleball and the screen. We would have put it in the capital mm -hmm. request with the tennis courts but our concern was the fencing yeah and and they didn't realize the the condition of the the the, um, the screen at the time we will be putting it in a, a for capital of 2020 um unfortunately the pickleball people will just have to bear with the and they'll be able to the use a sports the center too a and and yeah but it is mainly windy most of the time um with Maplewood Gardens, uh, we did have a few people that were really, really excited. Um, some kids were even watching out their window with the big digger machines going there, and they were so excited. They, but they didn't know what was going on uh, in terms of that playground being taken out. Um, is it possible for us to um, kind of engage our community with what's coming in with little signs or something to say that, you know, a, watch for a, a new idea. playground coming in this area or coming to you. Um, this is, uh, you know, part of a special project and it'll be a, a specially uh, accessible playground coming in May of 2019 or something. Because lots of people are asking and they don't know what's going to come there. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. We we kind of a remiss. We, we sort of go at a, at a fast pace to try to get things done. Uh, we originally were the, the contractor. We originally had them target for Canada Day. And they basically said, oh, no, we'll, we'll be able to beat that. And we'll be able to get it finished well before Canada Day. And so we said, yeah, go for it. And, and you, absolutely, I think that's probably something that we should be doing on all our capital projects. And, that basically putting a sign up saying, you know, coming here or, or road construction or whatever, you know, George Freeman Bridge or whatever you want. The, I mean, I think it's a valid point. So. Well, thank you. I got a lot of positive comments about it and it, people just generating excitement. So thank you very much. I defer to Ryan. Uh, Mr. Rockcroft. Well, thank you, Worship. Um, yeah, on signage, of course, um, most of our projects will have signage this year. Um, 
Yeah, I think just because that fell under the, the maintenance budget, we didn't tag it for a sign, but we'll make sure that there's something up for probably before next <laughs> council meeting. <laughs> uh, so we'll make sure there's a sign up there telling people, and thanks, Trent, <laughs> um, having that up. I'm kind of hoping them. Oh, I'm kind of hoping they're going to be way ahead of schedule. So. Um, all right, thank you, uh, Councillor Bauer. Uh, I just have a couple questions or a few questions for you, Craig. Uh, so one is, um, do we recycle the material that we pull off the roads? Do we recycle the pickle mix? Yeah. Uh, what we're using it for right now is we're using, we still need to continue to build down to the, the new snow uh, dump at the bottom of whatever, Boundary Road, is this what they, they actually call it, they have a name for it? Anyways, the one that's, that's going by the solar farm. So yeah. we're actually, we've, we've taken all that tonnage and we put it on there. Okay. So. Um, let's see. And, and I guess with, like, as far as, like, the grader goes, like, if we haven't kind of used it for five months, do you think we're going to have to even replace that, or can we get by without it? Uh, in that grader's case, we actually could have used it quite a bit. Okay. It's, it's the small one, and it's used for mainly alleyways and... and uh, and laneways, it's the one that actually can maneuver the best. Okay. Uh, I think we had to use bobcats and skid steers this year. Yeah. Uh, which doesn't really doesn't have the the, the push capabilities. Okay. But, uh, but we like we were kind of blessed that we didn't get a lot of snow in a lot of days. So, but. Yeah. But okay. right now it's going full out regrading all the alleyways. So. Okay. So. Um, and as far as I just wanted to mention about the adopt a flower bed slash park. Um, so I, I did talk to uh, Rob Peary with Communities in Bloom, and, and what I asked him was whether or not uh, their group would uh, be interested or have the capacity to help manage and implement this program rather than, you know, like, you know, giving it to a staff member to kind of implement. Um, you know, basically letting communities in bloom, uh, you know, like keep track of inventory and maybe even like process applications if that's, you know, like something that the town would want to work with them on. Uh, he did say that they will be meeting tonight to discuss that. Uh, so I don't have kind of an answer back on that yet. Uh, and the other suggestion I was going to make is um, perhaps we should consider having a, like at least two different tiers of of kind of, let's say, volunteers. Like one could just be people that are interested in just kind of, you know, picking up garbage basically and then the other people that could be you know interested in in actually doing the gardening type stuff mm -hmm. um, just to kind of more you know fully utilize people I guess it's yeah. um, a good idea and uh, yeah I don't have anything off the top of my head else for that um, but uh, I, I had something else I was going to mention, but I'll, uh, I'll have to recall it and get back to you. So, But thank you very much no, for your no report. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll move on to item 6.4, Strathmore Motor Products Sports Center update. Mr. Mark Preslaff. All right. I see it here. Oh, jeez. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. F5. F5. Okay. Um, please bear with me here as it's loading here. We're at zero percent, so it <laughs> could be a longer one than anticipated. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, Piper told me a joke earlier. Um, it's why. Was Cinderella not allowed to play soccer? And the answer is because she always runs away from the ball. My grandchildren will love that. Yeah. 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 It's a, it, a five-year-old. <laughs> I don't know if I can follow that act. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's clean enough, yeah. Um. Your Worship Council, I'm here to talk today about, uh, provide you a brief update on the uh, Strathmore Motor Products Sports Centre. Um, this uh, first slide here shows some of the, uh, the stats uh, for the first uh, four months, or really three months. Obviously, we opened late in January. Mm -hmm. um, the scans uh, are indicated our, our members that would be walking in or scanning their card and, and uh, utilizing the facility. 
drop-ins is obviously as explained there and number of patrons is a kind of a head count of uh, people walking through the door um, obviously January was was quite low because there was only I think we opened at like the 28th or 21st of the month um, obviously numbers increased up until the nice weather here in April where they've had a little bit of a de decline so um, early projections obviously I think there's some uh, we, we anecdotal evidence is that it's it's a very popular facility um, gymnasiums and drop-in basketball is one of the uh, the highlights of it and if you ask our staff there that's probably the number one activity right now at this time but um, obviously bear this in mind that we <coughs> excuse me that uh, you know obviously we didn't have the turf in until the end of February and things like that so and with the early spring we had uh, probably didn't get the same amount of utilization as we anticipated um, but I think we're you know we're, we're setting ourselves up for success um, come later in the fall when weather obviously is going to turn back to uh, back to reality here. Um, some of the facility rentals that we do have here, um, you can see Chaos Volleyball seems to be our biggest uh, our biggest uh, user of the facility. Um, they would like to, I think, use probably three or four days a week um, in terms of that. Um, minor baseball uh, is starting to utilize the facility with their batting cages and things like that. Um, we had actually had some rugby practices in there, uh, pals, and, and down the and down it goes. Um, the 38 hours associated with others are just one-off rentals. Um, so again, uh, promising in terms of how we uh, we're setting ourselves up for the for the rest of the year. Um, but we anticipate some additional usage um, by the lacrosse and soccer associations and other sports we may not have have uh, identified early on. Um, some of the, the facility enhancements uh, we talked about, uh, obviously the new artificial turf is in and installed. Uh, the lacrosse boards, uh, thanks to the, the diligent efforts of, the, uh, of, of our fire department, have been installed. Um, we are looking at right now into the, in terms of met with our glass supplier to try to get those gla the glass up or acrylic. Um, we should hopefully have that up by early next week, um, depending on, on how that process goes. Um, our bleachers are somewhat here. Um, due to some shipment errors, they've they've been we've got I think two of the five boxes that um, that are have arrived. Um, they're kind of half somewhat installed or built in the one of the corners. So trying to track down those other um, those other shipments. Um, some of the ideas for future enhancements that's uh, been floated to administration here is a, a, a batting cage or a golf cage. Um, we've uh, We've uh, had some significant, or we've had some usage of the uh, batting cage that's there now. It's um, to the general public, um, although it's been tagged as a um, George Freeman School or um, Strathmore Minor Baseball specific uh, batting cage. Um, we've had a couple inquiries about utilizing utilizing that as a as drop-in users. Uh, golf simulator is another another opportunity or another suggestion. Uh, the climbing wall, which as you can see here is one of the other ideas and then cardio and weight uh, cardio equipment and weights um, I've circulated that information uh, we've sp I've spoken to a supplier about potentially outfitting um, some corners of the uh, of the walking track with either cardio equipment and or weights um, based on some of the feedback that we'll discuss later on in the uh, the slides so um, it's just preliminary drawings so it's it's obviously it's it's not up to scale or um, and there's still need, we need some direction from council. Um, we'd have to still do some research as to whether the second floor could even the, the track and the uh, the floor could withstand dropping weights and things like that. So, um, but this is just what it could potentially look like given the space. Um, it's kind of our capital expenditures to date here. Um, you can see the the costs associated with the rental of the field and. The, and the installation and removal of it. Uh, lacrosse boards um, that are now installed and we estimate the glass approximately that caught um, around that number. Um, and then the spectator curtains um, around the north field, the protective, um, the protective curtain for both uh, the walking track as well as the spectators there. Um, those are the costs that we have um, quote unquote spent to date. Um, so we do have some additional things that will be coming in the next couple weeks. As I jump ahead, um, these are some of the uh, staff have been installed a comment or a suggestion box. 
and here are some of the uh, some of the that have been collected since we've opened here. Um, facility hours, obviously, it, when we opened, it was was much shorter. So I think we've addressed some of those issues. The uh, 6 a.m. Uh, one will will have to red flag that for the fall. Um, whether we can continue, whether we choose to operate that, and and based on the utilization. Um, small, obviously, the fees there is is pretty self-explanatory. There's some things there about the last hour of the of the day and things like that, which is somewhat problem problematic to to track. Um, but it's again, these are just suggestions and comments there. Um, we already already noted about the workout and weighted area, and you can see some of the comments there. And then uh, customer service, uh, the pass card system, our new Rec software went live uh, May well May first, so just last week. Um, so we're slowly implementing and changing people over from our old system to our new, which should eventually allow us to have swipe and go access once it's it's fully integrated and once all the existing memberships are brought over. So um, that will prevent hopefully less people waiting. But um, with our front staff, front desk staff. Um, they're tasked not only of manning that front desk, but also setting up the facility. Um, so again, we're starting to learn some of the cur the their learning curves of of having a facility. Um, how do we staff it um, to maximize the utilization while maintaining being fiscally responsible? So some of the facility updates that are going to be coming. We're going to have permanent facility signage should be installed hopefully by the end of the week. We told today, but uh, as of yet, not yet. Uh, we're doing some sponsorship uh, pillar wraps. Um, there's one that's uh, as a model, as a template that's there. Uh, we're installing four new basketball hoops around the uh, public, the Magna Cementine public gymnasium. Safety netting, as I, I, ta I talked about, and then scoreboards for both the north field as well as the, the gymnasium are all in the cards. Um, our hope is... Again, uh, assuming nothing's lost in uh, in uh, in shipment somewhere, is that that stuff would be installed um, probably after the long weekend. If not, it might have to be early early June. Um, that's the final slide I have for uh, for council. So if there's any questions, um, I'm, I'm available. Uh, Councillor Corbiel. Thank you, Worship. I have a quick. Uh, I would be hesitant to put in weights upstairs myself when I am I know it's not part of the school but it is still connected and I know they don't like it really um, want kids under 16 to use free weights I would worry about being dropped over the edge I would be more comfortable I'm all fine with some of the the other machines like your your bikes and whatever else and even some TRX like or something where you it's not it's not the heavy equipment Right, I'd be worried even about somebody misusing or rolling out into the track. You know, there's just so much liability. I think that you can do with the free weights. Um, and other than that, I think it's looking great, and it was really nice to use. It is really nice to use. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Corbiel. Councillor Sobel. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Mark. So, a couple questions. I I had the privilege of watching uh, our uh, our firemen. Um, put those boards together and I was actually kind of surprised that there was a lack of blue smoke <laughs> above those uh those in that in that hall because they looked a little frustrated I think it's a product of a good HVAC system <laughs> uh so uh, not what I'm sure that this is being thought of but I just I, I I'm sorry I just have to double check those boards will be marked, won't they? Uh, and somehow, so that when we take them down and put them back up, yeah, uh, it's going to be easier. Yes, through the chair. That was one of the, you know, at, at any anytime you build something new for the first time, yeah. especially something somewhat Absolutely. complicated like that, um, we anticipate approximately forty man forty man hours went into boards building that. Um, obviously, as the as the fire department or as our work crew gets more experience with it and are able to document some of the things, yeah. the processes in place, sure. um, I think that'll, that'll cut, down. cut down. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they did a great job and it's a great product. So uh, congratulations to our thanks to Mel for uh, Councillor Corbiel for, for bringing that up. I think it's a, a neat product anyway. It'd be neat with that glass going in. Uh, the other question I had was, is there any any contemplation of putting any kind of uh, camera system inside that facility? And I'm I'm thinking more in regards to um, safety and um, both safety and uh, uh, security. Yeah, my understanding through the chair is that there is a number of cameras already installed th um, through Golden Hills, and that there is some um, provisions to 
expand uh, the um, security or, or safety, the video camera footage CC, um, to the track and, and other, other elements of it. I don't know the specific details of where, where those camera ports are, are located, um, but that's one of the items that I've been, I've been aware of and been brought to my attention. Yeah, it would be of a concern to me if, if someone was walking, for instance, on the track by themselves with no one else around and, uh, and uh, um, became ill or something and, and ended up not being able to be seen. I, I just think it's a, it's a safety issue. Uh, and lastly, and I, I think I, I made note of this in, in, in an email, but uh, I was advised that there is access, we have access, uh, or the public has access, I should say, to the lounge area uh, next to the track uh, that is currently is owned by uh, the school system. Uh, after 4 p.m. and on the weekends, it, it, are we? Is there? A, do we have a issue with that, or is there a concern I think with that, that? Do you know? Through the chair, I think that's one of those those learning curves of, of working with a partner that we haven't really ironed out yet. Okay. Um, so that's one that's been brought to the attention of the school board, and we're trying to figure out uh, just a friendly. Actually, reminder. he he brought it to me. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's just a friendly reminder that um, you know what I think it's just a you know figuring out exactly that we should be accessing that and opening it up to the public and not locked down like the rest. And I think that's just a fact of, of reminding the janitors and uh, the custodial yeah. that that's the, that's the usage of that room. I've said it a million times, it's a beautiful facility and I, I just like to see it keep going and advancing and you guys are doing a great job. So thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Sobel. Councillor Cox. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my question is more along the lines of just curiosity. Um, I know that it's been a, a somewhat bothersome that there's rocks and pebbles and so on and so forth coming from the outside into on onto the track. Um, I know from uh, visiting, <laughs> there's a school out by Oak Tokes, um, Strathcona Tweedsmere. They have these monster sticky pads at the entrance of their to go up to the walking track? Have we thought about that or implemented any of those? Uh, that, that's, it's, I guess that's something to the chair that we haven't actually looked at. It's, mm. it's something that's utilized at the curling rink and in, in instances in clubs like that. Um, I think that's something definitely we can explore. Um, we have finally have our boot racks and things um, set up as well as, so trying to encourage, I think permanent, some, some permanent signage will also help, help uh, remind people that it's they, it's just kind of it's almost that last like that they have to walk across it it somewhat cleans their shoes before they yeah no it's something enter. we can definitely look at the challenge yeah. we'll have obviously is where to put that and whether yeah. it's on the track or in the stairwell going up but i think right. it's something we can explore yep thank you thank you councillor cox um uh, so one question I have that just, just for probably clarification for everybody is uh, if somebody comes to the SMP Sports Center to, let's say, play soccer or basketball, do we supply balls to them? Yeah, any, uh, any fitness equipment or any um, sporting equipment is included in the drop-in or membership. So um, the only thing that's needed at that point is uh, to sign it out so we obviously keep track of it and so we're not replacing the equipment as it goes, if it goes missing. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. All right, uh, so we're going to move on to item 6.5, which is administrative inquiry responses. Ms. Sawatsky. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Ms. Simpson, Director of Community and Protective Services, submitted responses to some admin inquiries for Council, and they're included in your package. Okay. No, we can't do that right now anyways, so... All right, uh, well then let's move on to item 6.6, .6, which is bylaw number 19-08, Council Code <coughs> of Conduct. Did you want to speak to this? Thank you, Your Worship. I apologize in advance as there's absolutely nothing cool about this report like nice events and <laughs> new equipment. <laughs> However, um, it's something that we need to talk about, so we're bringing it to Council. There, there's a report in your package along with um, a 
um, draft bylaw for council's review. Um, if council wants, I can give a um, presentation on it. If not, we can get to questions or suggestions from council. Uh, let's uh, let's just open it up for questions, uh, Councillor Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess Councillor Sobel. Oh, uh, Councillor Sobel. Oh, I know how I got did, did that. She shut hers off. The mine wasn't working. Well, mine's. I, I'm very short anyway, so I, it's a quick question. <laughs> it's a quick question. Five point two, uh, in regards to um, our illustrious mayor being council's official spokesman, uh, in the absence of the mayor's deputy mayor, and I have absolutely no issue with that. All inquiries from the media regarding official council position, and I guess that's. I, I, I'm glad to see it written that way, but I, I want to just clarify that we are talking about an official council position, uh, which is where the uh, mayor uh, is the official spokesman. Th this is not hindering a councillor from speaking to uh, the press in regards to uh, his personal um, personal involvement in a, in a situation, as long as he's not re representing the council. Yes, Thank, you. Thank you. I've been wrong three times today. Uh, Councillor uh, Peterson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, follow, following up to 5.2, the other thing that, that I was wondering if we if it shouldn't uh, articulate somewhere is that that mayor and council have the option or, or the mayor has the option of appointing someone as official spokesman. Because occasionally... Uh, that that happens, right? Where a, a mayor will ask a CAO to speak on his behalf, or I don't know if it's necessary to put in or not. Thank you. So what we could do with that clause is um, just also add after deputy mayor or a council representative, uh, or as as appointed by council. Okay. Thank you. And and then in five point one, just preceding that, I w I know where it, where it talks about a member must not claim to speak on behalf of council. Um, unless authorized to do so. And, and that appears pretty clear on the face of it until you get into committees of, of council, especially mm -hmm. where there is um, funding involved or mill rate involved. And, and um, I think that it would be useful, and not maybe in this document, but somewhere in the terms of references maybe for committees, that we address 5.1 uh, so that councillors have a, especially new councillors, I think, you know, pretty comfortable now, I'm really comfortable now, but I think there was a time when I wasn't involved or wasn't involving myself because I was so concerned about this. So I think having some kind of a, a parameter uh, guideline uh, in a terms of reference of committees for councillors, it would be helpful uh, around that. And then... Um, <coughs> On 8.4 on page 54, it was really interesting in a, in a conversation in a, in a meeting with Councillor Cox, uh, where Councillor Cox and I were, um, we were, it was brought up uh, that um, in, a, in a subsequent meeting where uh, a municipal member, <clears throat> not from here, uh, and, and this is, you know, broadly, you know, Alberta-wide, had, had refused to... Uh, to engage in a in a um, land acknowledgement, and I'm just wondering, and I don't need an answer tonight. But I'm just wondering if those kinds of things fall under this in terms of code of conduct, and and if there isn't, and and, and I know that that it's a that it's um, disputable ground, but I'm almost wondering if in a code of conduct, if we shouldn't try to incorporate something from the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the and in what are there not of the nine that are included in the Municipal Government Act, something to do with an adherence in terms of respect to that. I don't know if, if, it, if we could. I don't think it's been done before. I, I looked online to see if it was anywhere else, and I don't see it, but I think it might be timely with what other things that we're trying to do. Other than that, I think this is a, mm -hmm. a really good... Oh, I know, I had there on, on 14 under formal complaints... And B, it speaks to that all complaints shall be addressed to the investigator. And, and, and then in G, it says if the investigator is not counsel. So generally, an organization has a third-party investigator. Mm -hmm. But we don't identify who that is here. Right. So, I in but the, the Act does. 
yeah, the act does, so the draft bylaw that you mm -hmm. have in front yep. defines the investigator as either counsel or someone appointed by counsel. Is it useful to appoint somebody beforehand at the front end, like somebody within your organization or a third party to your organization? Like would a Rob Roycroft, you know, who has a Douglas Gore, people who have extensive experience in, in municipal government, I don't know if it would be worthwhile, but it might be. It might be. May I ask a question through the chair? Yep. Um, Councillor Peterson, you think it sounds like you're talking about a pre-identified arbiter almost or somebody investigator that is identified that we there would be conf confidence in that, as you said, like a... a maybe by name or maybe, maybe by position. Maybe by position or something. I don't know. It just, it just gives clarity hmm. okay. to that, Your Worship, that, that when somebody's messing around, they know who's going to oversee that. Okay, let, let us turn our minds to that. Thank you. Thank Those you. are all my questions. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Councillor Peterson. Uh, Councillor Sobel. Can I have one more quick kick at the cat, uh, Your Worship? Uh, so I, I was really happy to see compliance and enforcement in here because without, without that, the bylaw is actually, in my view, anyway, useless. And, 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 and this, is, this was actually a little bit more extensive than I thought it would be, mm -hmm. and I'm happy for that. Um, so, um, I'm going to assume that this has been prepared, especially this section has been prepared with some legal assistance, I'm hoping. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. This actual template and all of the material in it was actually prepared by Brownlee Law, um, AUMA, and AAMD, AAMDNC. Anyway, okay. Well, I'm 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 happy to hear that, and of course I, I'm 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 focused on H and I, which, which, um, in my uh, from what I can read, uh, allows for some monetary um, uh, uh, recourse. Recourse, yeah, sure, great word. Uh, and and the reason I bring that up is because we've run into a situation in the past where that was a, a major issue. We had difficulty trying to recoup dollars that did not belong to a person um, and 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 we feel confident that if if uh, as per a code of conduct if monies are are received um, improperly uh, that we could use uh, either H or I to to uh, have the town recoup those dollars does that your worship you could yes thank you that's all I can I just, I really appreciate the talk. Yes, uh, yeah, it's good. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, one question I have, uh, Jennifer, is um, just like for 5.3 where it talks about um, to reflect the official position and will of council as a whole. Is, is there any way for council to have an official position as a whole aside from by resolution or by motion? Your Worship, that clause, I believe, directly speaks to decisions made in, in council, which would have to be by resolution or policy or bylaw. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's Things we're still fighting about. You can talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Uh, I guess uh, if there's no further questions, then thank you very much, Ms. Swatsky. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we will now move on to number 6.7, which is bylaw number 19-09, procedure bylaw amendment bylaw. bylaw. Right, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, council was provided with the draft bylaw and report um, prior to the meeting. If council would like me to go over the changes, um, Suggested uh, yeah, if, we yeah, could. I think, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind just for the public just to uh, briefly go over some of the changes that we've been talking about. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so
So at Council's um, last spring strategic workshop, administration presented Council with some changes to help um, streamline, um, shall you say, uh, the Council procedures during Council meetings, sorry, Council meetings in general. And some of those items included um, implementing a consent agenda to deal with routine items that Council deals with normally at a council meeting, um, or to deal with items that they've already discussed um, when they're in committee of the whole, um, et cetera. We've also included in this bylaw um, some more guidelines around delegations, um, specifically timelines for delegations, um, how many delegations we would allow per meeting, um, and, just, and things that council would hear um, Sorry, hear from delegations about and things that they would not. So those have been also included in the bylaw. Uh, and also we've included, um, we've amended the notice of motion provision that notice of motions have to be, be submitted by an agenda deadline. We've changed that so that notice of motions can be submitted um, prior to, any time prior to the meeting. So just to make it a little bit easier to bring matters forward. And basically that is it. We've also included the order of business um, in the bylaw, which would just reflect the changes um, identified. Perfect. Um, yeah, so for uh, people at home, basically we're just going to make these meetings go a lot faster and more efficiently. So, uh, Councillor Peterson? Your Worship, just a question to legislative services. And I, I know that sometimes people are uh, thrown off by a consent agenda and they think that it's confining. So I'm, I'm wondering if in the bylaw, if there would will be a, uh, an addendum that, that outlines the process for a consent agenda. So, oh, sorry. Thank you. No, I forgot the question. So um, so the process for consent agenda, um, we could put it in the bylaw. I did not include it originally. It would be kind of... Uh, an addendum. An addendum. Or an, absolutely, we could include that kind of as an attachment to, to the bylaw so that everyone is aware of what council is dealing with and in order to be transparent. And, the, and your worship to follow, the, just the most important part of a consent agenda for the public to know and for every councillor to know <laughs> Is it that every council member has the right to lift any item off a consent agenda and put it back onto the main agenda mm -hmm. through process? So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Sobel. Thank you. Um, first, uh, yeah, it, uh, we just, are the pages just misnumbered or is, uh, was there just no page six? No, no, the handout that you have in front of you is, um, I apologize. It's not the it's full. It's yeah. It's also, we, it is on, the, on our, our email. Yeah. I, just, I just noticed in the document. Right? If you like administration, you could. It's in the email. What's on page six? Um, notice of motion stuff and. Yeah. It's the delegation, more, more the stuff on delegation, I think. Motion. So that, that's probably. So. That brings me to my next question, which is probably on page six. So there's a limit of two delegations per uh, meeting. And um, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned uh, because life just doesn't work like that sometimes. Sometimes you have to have three. So uh, I don't, I, it, it, and I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I know I, re I read it. I read it from the from the email, but now I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure if it said that there was possibility of of of, uh, of extending that to three with council approval. So your worship does not say that in the draft in front of you. However, that's exactly what we want, what I want to talk about um, with council today. We could do it a number of different ways. We could put a limit. Sorry, we could put a limit, um, a number limit as to how many we would, or we could put a time limit on it and and schedule, you know, up to the, up to three, or we could do thirty minutes. We could do forty. It's really kind of what council wants to do in in those situations. So I, I for my own personal view, I, I I get very concerned, and I like the way this is phrased in regards to the maximum of ten minutes. Uh, with the option to extend with uh, with a majority of council, I and and that's in I think section uh, mm -hmm. 
whatever section that is. Uh, section 88 uh, allows that. And I, I, I like that because, once again, we don't know what we don't know. And, and um, there are times where um, the, uh, the 10 minutes is going to be sufficient. But if, if, if it's a matter of that, that's very important to this council uh, and, and it takes another 45 minutes or whatever, uh, if it's something that's relevant and the and, and majority of council want to hear it, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to shut that out. I, I, I don't want to just close the door on it completely. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Sobel. Uh, did you want to respond to that? Okay, thank you. So I think that that would actually um, kind of solve um, your concern is just by putting the, the option for council to extend or to um, change the requirement for two by majority vote. And if I might, sorry, Mel, if I might suggest, we can do that in increments of, I think we, you know, I don't see any reason why we can't be specific as to how far we're going to extend that so that it doesn't, it doesn't go for hours and hours. I mean, we could say we'll extend this this discussion for twenty minutes or, or whatever. Just that's just a suggestion. I, I, I'm not sure where we're going. Where we're going on this? I just, I just, I'm just concerned that Do I want to handcuff this council um, no. and our delegations that should be before us. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Sobel. Uh, Councillor Cox. Just in response to that, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just wonder, is it is it the delegation that's speaking too long, or is it our questions that are taking more too long? Mm -hmm. Are you referring to both? Because well, I, as it stands right now, right, if they speak for 10 minutes, but council then proceeds to talk to them for 20 minutes, it, are we addressing that part of it? So in the draft um, that you may or may not have in front of you, it does st it does say that the time limit is inclusive of questions from council. So ten minutes inclusive, that is, it is pretty short. Yeah, so we could extend that, or, or we could take out the inclusive. Yeah, I would just say ten minutes for them to speak, and then questions are outside of that probably. If, if I could, with with an option, yeah. with an option to extend the ten minutes, yeah, with yeah. majority of council approving, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But, but should we also be keeping a time limit to us? Mm. That could be our own personal. That's. But I don't like that. No. Yeah, but then not. The, but you're who's confined. to say? But you're confined by order, by rules of order. You are. Who's to say we don't? You know, what if questions go on for forty-five minutes? And fill us. Call the fill us. <laughs> yeah. And we do have rules of order, which prohibit you from asking more than two questions. Yeah, five, max. Mm, not really. That's not any motion. So you can speak to, no limit on questions. <clears throat> How many times you can speak to a motion? Isn't it? Speak to a motion. Yes. Yeah. Councillor Corbiel. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Are we going to see the list of delegations? Like every delegation that, say, comes in, are we going to, I guess, have a say? Or is it just the follow here? And then if they don't follow within the parameters, they're like denied? Or how? Um, yes, like if I could add on to that, I would personally prefer if uh, a list was presented to council uh, to, you know, give kind of the up or down on, um, you know, let's say by majority vote, um, just in case mm -hmm. there's uh, interest to hear from a certain party that... Um, so what we could do, just a suggestion, is any questionable delegation that may not fall within the guidelines of the procedure we could report back to council that we've received a request and and see if council still wants to hear from from them or not yeah i think that'd be good just in case we get contacted by these people and we can at least say yeah you know we've we've been made aware of your application and you know uh, councillor peterson thank you worship i think there's a difference between delegations that request to come and people that we have asked to come. Mm -hmm. And so, so presentations, record, so 
we make that, in the bylaw, we make that distinction, or we could make that distinction. And, and yeah, yeah, it, 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 and so I think that that could cover off some of this. So I think about choosing whether they come before us as a delegation or as a report to council is also an option that we have within this. And I think the limit, putting the two limit, I think, isn't really useful. I don't think we need it. I don't think we need the number there at all. For presentation? No. I think it could be left up to the chairperson, to be honest. No, no. never. You don't think? Never. Who should it be left up to? I think I think that, that delegations coming forward um, are left up to legislative services. And in terms of, you know, understanding the time and context of a of a schedule that a council sits to, mm -hmm. and and they they determine that if if something is as Jennifer just pointed out questionable under the procedural bylaw, then it can come to a vote of council. But other than that, I think this rests with her. She knows, mm -hmm. she knows the context and and what our schedules are and how our council meetings are. You know what our agendas are. She has the mo most information. Okay. Well, like I would agree with you that I don't think it should be necessarily limited to two. Um, so if, yeah, if, go ahead. Thank you, Worship. I just wanted to mention about um, people or groups that council invites to come speak to them. Um, moving forward, it's legislative services um, practice not to schedule those um, groups or people um, under delegations. It's it's a different it's a different category and to invite someone to come speak to council and cut them off after 10 minutes sometimes isn't perceived or, or taken well. <laughs> um, so definitely there, however, the, um, we may want to keep in mind time as well when we're bringing those uh, matters forward as well as requesting information ahead of time so council is well um, educated on what's coming forward. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments about this? Seeing none, thank you very much. All right, uh, we'll move on to item 6.8 now. Thank you, Worship. Um, earlier today, um, May 8th, marked <coughs> McHappy Day, um, uh, where McDonald's sponsors the Ronald McDonald houses across uh, Canada that support... Um, families of children who have been hospitalized. And uh, our particular McDonald's does an extraordinary uh, amount of work in this. And it was very interesting being there this morning uh, to, to see the managers and the owner looking at the sheets and saying, we can't believe how good this community is. It was so easy to get volunteers to come into this particular McDonald's. And by, I think by noon or by the time Councillor Sobel came in today, they had already raised $1,300 of their $3,000 um, limit. And when I was there this evening, they, they were still, the lineups were out onto the street and uh, probably causing bylaw uh, a headache. But really, really good to see. And the other thing that I want to, that I want to say in terms of this whole idea of corporate citizenship is that, um, Usman Jat and, and his team of people that work here in Strathmore are extraordinary in the way that they've rolled out their book of business as corporate citizens. They work really hard to make sure that there is an inclusive process. I, I saw today people of, of um, many nationalities and, and um, ethnicities. I saw uh, people with um, uh, unique life circumstances and special needs working in that environment uh, fully um, embraced by all the people that were in there and working in this team environment. And I find that very, very encouraging. And uh, the work that I, I work also with many different other community agencies from the Strathmore Night Shelter to Communities in Bloom. And, and it never once have I ever noted McDonald's to turn down any organization, any nonprofit organization that came to them for, for support for their um, organization in, uh, in carrying out an event. So I just want to give a big shout out to all the community members that supported McCappy Day and to that, uh, to that magnificent organization and, uh, and of course, to um, our people that helped out. Uh, it was a really, really good day and good to see, and thanks to them. Thank you, Councillor Peterson. Councillor Cox, would you like to add to that? Yes. Thank you, Councillor Peterson and Councillor Sober, for attending. 
Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll echo that and say uh, thank you very much uh, to the Strathmore McDonald's for everything that they have done for the community and uh, thank you to all the volunteers uh, who helped with Make Happy Day and, and of course our council. So thank you very much. Um, all right, so I guess that brings us to the end of our regular agenda. So I'll take a motion to go in camera. So move. Oh, sorry. No, no. I'll, yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. I actually forgot to read administrative inquiry from Councillor Sobel um, into the minutes, so I'll read it. It just says, um, it's, a, it's in regards to compost. It says, I would suggest that it is fitting to congratulate our citizens in regards to how they have embraced the new composting program. Statistics clearly point to a drastic reduction in, of composting materials going to the landfill. And congratulations is in order as well to waste management who have gotten the composting program order issue under control. One of the side projects affiliated with composting in other communities, i.e. Calgary, allows for citizens to reap some benefit from their efforts. For the next three Sundays, Calgary residents can attend their compost yard and self-serve about 100 litres of compost. My question to administration is whether an inquiry can be made to our waste management officials to see whether they are willing to initiate a program which would give a little product back to our citizens, or residents, sorry. I was under the impression that they could do that already. Is that not right? They do. No. no. You can bring a, a container and they'll fill up the compost. That's, that's what I was told. Any container? Any size? Yes. I was told no. Under Colin, you used to be able to. Yeah, under Colin. I don't think so but you anymore. you can't do it anymore. Uh, well. Oh, okay. I'm wondering. Well, we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Okay. All right, well, if thank you. If that's a yeah. fact, if that's... that's oh, Your Worship, yeah, the... It should be part of the contract. However, I'll have David contact waste management and we'll, uh, we'll respond to council. It may be just that we're not doing a great job advertising it. And if that's the case, I think that uh, we can change that, work with comms to fix that. So, yeah, we'll have David put together a response. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh Move oh. to come out of committee of the whole. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All in favor of coming out of committee of the whole. All right. Go, Matt. And uh, does anybody want to make a motion for extending the meeting? No. I don't think we'll have no. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Well, I'll take a motion to go in camera then, please. You're the only one that's on. You're on, Bob. Okay. I move.